Welcome to another episode of Founders Club. Today I'm gonna to be sitting down with the founder of Carrot.com, Trevor Mock, and we're gonna be breaking down how he generates millions of real estate seller leads online, how he used creative real estate investing strategies to buy his first four unit property back in college, which he still owns today, and some simple real estate marketing strategies that you can use in your business to dominate Google in your local marketplace. If you have any questions, put them in the box down below. Make sure you hit that subscribe button for future episodes, and we'll see you on the inside. All right, welcome everyone to another episode of Founders Club. I'm excited for you guys to be joining us on this one. Really excited about my guest today, Trevor, the founder of Carrot.com. And uh, I saw an interesting stat on your website that I wanted to give you a shout out about because this is pretty epic. It said, as of today, you've generated 2,356,261 real estate leads. And you have thousands of ranking websites in the top three placements on Google all over the place. So it, it, everywhere, man. And most of them are sellers. Most of those leads are sellers. Which is killer. And uh, I want to get into all that. And uh, I'm excited to kind of pick your brain on a lot of the entrepreneur stuff that you're doing, a lot of the marketing stuff that you're doing, because um, you are involved in several exciting things. But uh, another thing that made me kind of laugh on your website that I was like, I'm definitely starting with that question was <laughs> you said that you once biked across Ireland fueled by Guinness and a full breakfast. Of course, man. So tell me about that because uh, that sounds pretty cool. Dude, so I'll, yeah, let, let me tell you about that. And I'm going to do it with this one little angle. So uh, when when we all become entrepreneurs, I think we have some similar desires, right? You want freedom. You want flexibility. Uh, I think we want to make an impact. and But freedom and flexibility is a big part of it. So this is 2009, Oliver. I was the only one in my friend group out of college. I graduated college in 06. Uh, that was an entrepreneur. Everyone else had jobs. And so they were planning this Ireland trip for months, months and months. And I was with uh, one of my friends literally three weeks before the trip. This is way before Carrot. And they said, we're going to Ireland. And he threw out the offer knowing that normal, like people with jobs wouldn't be able to do that. And I'm like, dude, when are you going? He goes, in three weeks. I'm like, shoot, let me check. And I checked back the next day. I'm like, dude, I'm in. So I was able to go. It was five of us college friends. And we were in uh, we were literally backpacking around Ireland. We'd pick up a map, point at the map and say, where are we going the next day? And one day we happened to be in a little town called Killarney uh, in the southwest side of Ireland, a little teeny town. We stayed up way too late, drank way too many Guinnesses. There was a bike rental shop across the street. And we picked up the map, pointed to another town called Dingle up the Dingle Peninsula. And we said, well, <laughs> let's bike there. And so we put on our packs, probably still hung over and biked what we thought was an easy 60 kilometers, but half of it was uphill. And it was, I thought it was gonna die half the time, but it was an amazing, amazing mental um, achievement being able to bike in a headwind on the coast up Dingle, hung over on a bike that had one speed. It was fun. <laughs> I love that. Uh, when did you do that? It was 2009, that was a while ago. 2009. So yeah. is that, uh, was that well-documented or was that pre-documentation days? I've got pictures of it. Yeah, there, there's a few pictures way back when, probably right after I started my Facebook, and then I've got some on, on, the, on the phone still. So there's definitely pictures. Uh, it, was, it was an adventure, though, man. It's fun. Very cool. So, all right, well, let's jump into the business stuff because yeah. I, I know you have some really exciting successes and some really cool projects that you're involved in, and I want to kind of pick your brain a lot on that. Um, but why don't we just kind of start with how you initially got into the business? Because I know you got in really early, right out of college. Um, so talk to me about the early days. Yeah, dude. So I, I, I didn't, I didn't grow up like a lot of people. You know, selling selling lemonade at the lemonade stand and selling candy to the buddies and stuff. Like I, I didn't want anything to do with business. Uh, my, my parents actually owned small businesses when I was probably in early grade school. I remember my mom started her first her, her business in our basement. She was helping people with weddings and things like that. And so we had we had a row of shelving downstairs that would have, you know, ring bearer pillows and things like that. And then she would do these consultations. And so uh, that was my first intro into it. And honestly, when I was 10, 12, 13 years old, we were packing chairs on Saturdays to weddings. We were setting up tents. We were tearing down weddings on Sunday afternoons. 
My parents worked a lot of hours and uh, dude, it was the last thing that I wanted to do. I, I thought that's what business was. You know, I, I literally thought business is you slave yourself to death and you hope that you get an outcome in 30 years. And so I went the opposite direction. Um, thought I wanted to be a baseball player and then a doctor and like all those kind of dreams uh, ended up not being uh, the right course. Then I got into college and had this really, really uh, charismatic professor who um, uh, it's a bummer, terrible bummer. He passed away last week. He was like my favorite professor. His name is Ari DeGroote. And he was an attorney and a real estate investor. And he would go up there talking about business law, which is like the most boring subject in the world, or it should be. But he made it interesting by tying it into how he was using business law and real estate. So he, he would take out these, these real estate contracts on an apartment building that he bought or on this thing that he did over here. And he said, let's walk through this, this deal and walk through the structure of it. And I'm like, I want to be just like that guy. And so uh, I set a goal to buy an investment property before I got out of college and uh, to be an attorney. And so I got one of them right. Um, I flunked <laughs> the LSATs getting into law school. I, I didn't get into any, even the waitlist ones that the internet said everybody should get into. If you have a pulse, I didn't get into any of them. Um, but I did buy that first rental property when, when I was 21, literally with the Carlton Sheets course, no money down four unit building cash flowed from day one. I still own that one today. So that got me into the end of the game. And then after that, I'm like, okay, this business thing might not be so bad. Let me see if I can figure it out. And mm. next, next chapter of the journey happened. That's killer. Uh, I, before we go to that next chapter, I want to kind of talk about that a little bit because, mm. um, you know, a lot of people, especially at that age, uh, would be really intimidated to move forward on a purchase like that, especially yeah. like a multifamily property. Um, so how did you, you just, I mean, did you just get the Carlton sheets course and, and get after it or kind of walk me through how you put together that first deal, how you found yeah. it, how you funded it, all that, all that good stuff. Dude, I, I like it. The funny thing is my method of getting that deal has not changed almost at all. I, I closed that deal in 2004, uh, 2004. Uh, what I do today is almost the same. So it's the same thing. And I'll walk you guys through it. Uh, dude, the first thing I thought I wanted to be a house wholesaler because you go to the internet and you look at how do you become a real estate investor? And that's kind of where everyone says to start. Um, and, and that was, you know, I didn't want to become an agent, you know, at that time. And that wasn't uh, interesting to me at that time, but I'm like, I, I want real estate to be part of my, my long-term gig. I just don't know what. And so, dude, I was in the forums for months, you know, it was in the library is before, before we had these things, you know, where we could actually look up information on our cell phones or hop on a live stream like this, it was going in the forums and learning. And uh, I launched a website. I started to get leads from sellers. I started to talk to some sellers and dude, I discovered, I'm like, I, for me, I didn't want to do that every day. I said, what if I could buy something once or do something once and have it produced for me for years? What if I could do one something once and have it produced for years? And so that's what I did. I, I, um, found a little thread in that forum that said, Hey, right now there's a lot of people who are older who have rental properties. And this is still the case today, even more so today. There's a lot of people who are older and have rental properties and many of them want to sell those rental properties, but they don't want to have to pay the extra tax by collecting a full cash payment. So they'll, they'll take terms and um, open up the Carlton sheets course and literally went through it. And just, I started uh, going through the public records. I went down to the courthouse there in that small town in Oregon um, I knew that I wanted a property around the college and hospital because I think I could keep those pretty busy. So I first identified an area in town that would have less risk and more demand and then went to, down to the courthouse and said anything within this realm, uh, I'd like anything that's a multifamily or the person's owned it longer than 10 years. And they gave me a list. Uh, it cost a little bit, but it wasn't that much at that time. And I literally, um, Oliver, went down that list and started writing uh, letters to those people, like handwriting letters. Um, you know, got a horn out the door, but I uh, started handwriting letters and talked to a few, talked to a few people. This one gentleman was um, retired, had three properties, did not want to deal with tenants and toilets and stuff anymore. And uh, he said, you know what? I would be willing to take a chance on you. All I need is $10,000 down and I'll carry the note at 6%. And so that's what we ended up doing. And I can go into any more of the details if you want. Wow. I love that. I, yeah. I definitely want to unpack that a little bit. Cause that that's really cool. And I, um, I love the fact that you bought it on terms. Cause I think that, uh, that's one thing that will be coming back, I think right now. Yep. Um, and as you know, the rest of the whole pandemic stuff continues to shake out, 
I think terms deals are really going to come back. And I think creative real estate investing is going to make a big comeback. Um, so tell me about, so what you, you were handwriting the letters, what was the criteria of the people you were sending those letters to? Yep. So for, for me, um, I wanted to, cause I, I learned this online. So I just thought I would just do what people are saying to do online. Um, I wanted to, to dive into anything that was three units or above, because at that time I was going to move into one of the units. Like that was the plan was move into one of them, finish out college. If I had to do any work, I'd be on, on, on property. Uh, I ended like up not doing it kind of. Yeah, exactly. I ended up not moving into one of the units, but I wanted something that was between three and 10, uh, over 10, over 10 and intimidated me quite a bit, even the four did. Um, but, and then it, it had to, the person had to own it for at least 10 years. And so that was it. I was pretty, and it had to be in this area and that was it. So I identified the part of the town who would likely have equity and the, the, the size of property. And then we were able to negotiate that. And the funny thing is you talk about terms and how they're popular today. The building I'm in now, I'm in another small town in Oregon. We have 8,000 square feet here. That's an entrepreneur co-work space. Then I bought the building next door last year. Um, we bought it for 365 and I bought that on terms owner carry, uh, 5% interest rate, uh, 365 was the total purchase price, 15,000 bucks down. That's it. And so now we're, we're building apartments upstairs and we're putting uh, retail downstairs guys. Terms are amazing. And we can dive into some ways we're doing that with some other deals too. Yeah, no, that's killer. I, uh, I, I definitely want to jump, get into that. Uh, I've got a few more um questions around that the uh, coming up especially how you put together that co-working deal because i think yeah. that's a really killer deal as well and i think cool. uh something that will also be big kind of in the future because um i think everyone's kind of tired of working at home but Dude. maybe doesn't want to go back to the big office with tons of people but i think smaller like private offices are going to be a big thing you know easy to clean easy to social distance yada mm -hmm. yada yada but let me, uh, let me, let me, let me, let's go back to the journey. So you did that. Um, now tell me about when you started carrot and yep. what was kind of the motivation there. Maybe also explain what carrot is for those that don't know yet. Gotcha. Dude, dude I, I love it. So I, I, I got that property there and then my wife and I, we moved up to Portland, Oregon, the, the big city for here. And she was going to school, but I, I, I gave myself a year all over and it was, a, it was a big learning lesson for me. I said, okay. Um, I, I know what I don't want. I'm not really surely clear what I do want, but I know that at that time I didn't want to have to go to a job and work in a job for 30 years. So I said, um, I, I looked at it and looked at my risk possibility and said, the worst case scenario, if this doesn't work is I stop paying my rent. I've got two, three months before I can get evicted. And then we'll either move back down with my parents or I'll figure something out. So that's really worst case scenario, which wasn't that bad. Um, best case scenario in that year was, man, I figure out how to be an entrepreneur. I figure out how to sell. I figure out how to do something on my own. And that that's catapults me into the, into the, the year after. And for me, I started to learn how to flip that risk profile where, uh, where before I would think about what happens if I do this thing and, 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 and you don't step into it because you're fearful of what will happen if you do something. And about halfway through that year, I'm like, damn, it's that's backwards. It's actually what will happen for sure. What's 100% guaranteed to happen if I do not do that thing. And I was usually more, more scared of what would 100% guaranteed would happen. I was more scared of that if I didn't do it than what the possible worst case scenario was if I did the thing. And mm -hmm. so I stepped into it and uh, that's when I started to learn about the internet uh, other than just like researching papers and going on to real estate forums. Um, I was working with a mortgage brokerage company. They were the only one who actually accepted uh, a marketing uh, consulting offer that I pitched for a thousand bucks a month. I had a little desk in there. I had my rental property, which didn't make me any money because all that money went back into reserves and making sure that, you know, the, the building was taken care of. So I wasn't really making cash money on that one property. And the person, the mortgage broker walked into my office or into that little cubby and I was doing cold calling on Craigslist for him, trying to figure out how to get them leads for borrowers. And he said, go to Google and type this up. And it was like Portland, Oregon, uh, Oregon mortgage broker. And I typed it up and he goes like, how do you get me right there? Can you do that? And at the top of Google, because he said, if I can get there, it seems like that's the most motivated people. That, <laughs> that would be a good place to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like they, they're actively searching for something. Like I don't have to hit them with the radio or TV ad to, to, to activate their demand. They're already in demand. They're searching for a solution. They're probably closer to their buy decision, which means they're more motivated, higher conversion. 
And I said, I don't know how to do it, but I'll figure it out. And so the next 12 to 24 months, man, that was kind of my journey, diving in and learning how Google worked and learning how to set up websites that, that ranked well in Google. And then I would start to get traffic from Google, really motivated people, but they weren't converting to my website. And so then I'm like, okay, let me learn that now. And then it was like, shoot, if you adjust these elements on a website, they'll actually convert into a lead at a higher rate. Well, let me try this other thing. And so that was kind of the journey all over where I learned how to, uh, how to create content that people liked that solved their problems, get it on a website, structure the website in a way that Google liked, make it so it ranked really high. And then how do you actually get that website to convert at a really high rate uh, to, uh, those visitors to leads? And that was kind of my next three to four years where I, I kept on honing that skill set. I uh, did some consulting, started a publishing company in the real estate space, honed that skill set more. And this was 2011, uh, Oliver, where, where Carrot came up. So by that time, I was already in the real estate world, had a few more real estate deals under my belt, but I was really good so at leasing. this time, would you consider yourself like doing agency work for people and just helping them rank? Is that kind of how it started? Yep. Yep. I was, I was doing agency work and helping people rank. And then, um, in 2008, I started my own company that was an online publishing company, you know, where we had the courses, we had the, the webinars, the content and all that. And that's where the, the conversion rate optimization side of my skill set really ramped up because when you're, when you're bringing in a hundred thousand dollars you know, a month in revenue, 200 grand a month in revenue, and then it goes back down to 40,000 the next month, you start to really look at all those levers you can pull pretty big. And so this was, this was 2011 or 12, man, after three to four years of kind of grinding my way through school of hard knocks, learning the skill sets, uh, that I didn't know what I was going to do with eventually. And I remember I had my first daughter at, at, uh, 2010 and I had this dream as an entrepreneur to get more freedom and more flexibility, you know, like have, have that entrepreneur's dream. And. Uh, one, one morning my wife went to work and my, my daughter went to the nanny cause I was supposed to be working and I was laying in bed at 10 AM and, uh, looking at the ceiling, not wanting to get out of bed to do the work and the job that I had created for myself, which was just the weirdest thing. Cause I'm going, man, my friends and people around me think I've got it made, which, uh, which I did. I just, I wasn't grateful, frankly. Um, but they, they thought I had it made when actuality, this business trapped me. The way that I was doing my marketing trapped me because my marketing started to become joint venture driven. We did a lot of direct mail. Um, I hadn't really figured out how to scale up inbound really well. We were doing it, but it wasn't scaling well. And, and I started looking at it going, damn, what parts of my business do I love? And what parts of my marketing do I love that, that are actually producing me good results? And during that time, that's when I probably had the most, the, the biggest transformation, mental transformation I'd ever had was in 2000. 11 and 12. And I took that energy from that morning of not wanting to do the work. And I said, okay, the advice that people have been telling me up to this point, um, not saying it's wrong, but it hasn't worked for me. And that advice was this, it was find what people tell you you're good at, find what makes you good money. People are willing to pay you a lot of money for that thing. And they tell you you're very good at it. They're saying like, that's your unique ability. You should do more of that. And I did a lot of it. I was good at creating campaigns. I was good at doing a lot of different things like that. Um, but it sucked the energy out of me, man. And so I said, well, what if I flip it around and rather than focusing on efficiency, rather than focusing on the next productivity hack, rather than trying to be more productive, what if I just focus on energy, right? What if I just said, could I do work and build a business that actually gave me more energy than it took away from me? And what types hmm. of activities would give like me that. more energy than they took away? And I created something called the energy audit um, that I still use today. Uh, I use it every single quarter. It's completely changed the way that I do business and do life. And I teach it to my team members and you call that the ener energy audit An energy audit, man, like change my life. Uh, and I'll, I'll like tell it. people what it is and I'll give you guys yeah. the worksheet, no opt-in required, nothing. Like I just want people to use it. Awesome. Let's um, break it down. Cool. So carrot.com forward slash energy, just go grab the worksheet. Uh, no opt-in, like I said, no strings attached. I just want you guys to get it. Uh, grab a piece of paper and draw a line down the middle. And when you, when you need to do the energy audit is this, when you get to the end of a week uh, or too many weeks in a row, too many days in a row where you're like, I feel like I've done a lot of things, but I don't feel like I've accomplished a lot or I don't feel like I've moved the needle or I feel like I'm busy every day, but I get to the end of the day and I go home to my wife and kids and my energy's gone. Like I'm leaving mm -hmm. all my best energy um, in, in the job and just my crumble, you know, the, the, the crumbles are left over for my family. 
Um, it's when you think, man, maybe I should just go get a job because this entrepreneur thing, you know, it, it's not as exciting as I thought it was going to be over the long term. There's there's things that are, but in general, I just feel like my energy being sucked and maybe a, a W-2 would be better. And um, if you start to feel those things more often, you need to do the energy audit. So line down the middle of the paper, on the left side of the paper, drains energy. And then I want you to go through today and write all the things in a given week that, that um, on an average week that drain your energy. Okay. It could be things at home. It could be work items. It could be whatever, but these are things on an average week right now. What are the things that just drain your energy um, and put everything that drains your energy there, as, uh, even and especially the things that make you the most money. Okay. Now on the other side of that piece of paper, right. Gives energy on the other side of that line. And write all the things in your life, uh, business, at home, everything that gives you energy, especially the things you're not currently doing or doing enough of. Okay, so it could be working out. It could be, you know, I love strategy, but I hate execution, right? But my whole job before 80% of my job was execution. And, and I'm sitting there going, man, I, I would love to just get in front of a whiteboard and blow the whiteboard up and then leave. Like if I could just do that all day, it'd be awesome. Or I love doing these kinds of things. But I, I didn't have that built into my business, so I didn't think I could do it. And all the things that made me money or like the 80-20 um, were the things I was doing that drained my energy. And I'm looking at it going, the advice I've been given is uh, focus on the stuff that makes you money and people say you're great at. And that's what I've been doing, and it's driving me uh, uh, into the ground. And how do, the heck do I eliminate these things from my life or from my work that actually make me a lot of money? And so I did. So here's what you need to do next at the bottom of the energy audit. I want you to give a ratio because what's not measured can't be moved, right? So what percentage of your average week, what percentage of your, aver of your average week is in energy draining things? And then on the other side, what percentage of your, av of your average week is in energy giving? For me at the time, Oliver, it was like literally 80% energy draining. I was making good money, but I was miserable. And on the other side was 20% energy giving. And this is my thought. I said, okay, if I could just do this quarterly, and if I could move, let's say from 80% to 70% in the next couple of quarters, and then if I could maybe over the next two to three years, move it from 80% energy draining to 80% energy giving, imagine how amazing business would be. And maybe I would even make more money possibly. And I could reach that entrepreneurial dream that I set out for. And so I did that. And every quarter you take that out, circle the one or two things in the energy drain column that are draining your energy mo the most, even and especially if they make you a lot of money. Um, and then write down how many hours per week you're spending on those one or two things. And then go to the energy give side and say, if I were to get rid of that 14 hours from these two things every week, what would I now add back to my life energy wise? Well, I'm going to work out now, or you know what? I don't know how I'm going to make money on it, but I'm going to make a podcast and it gives me energy. And I don't care if it makes me money because I'm getting rid of these things off my lap. Someone else is going to do these and I'm getting energy, which I think I'll be able to put more out to the world and it'll come back. And so I did that, man. And today it's you know around the 80, 20, now 80% energy giving, 20% energy uh, taking. So um, follow the energy audit, y'all. Chase energy, not productivity is your main thing. Um, and I think you can change the game for you. I, I love this. I, I, I really like this. I think uh, as an entrepreneur, I think uh, energy, and I can totally relate to what you said at the beginning of just like going through a day and being busy all day and at the end of the day being like, I, I have no idea what I just did all day. Oh yeah. We all, we all can. And, yeah. and so let's, let's dive a little deeper on, on to each side of the quadrant. So yep. give me some examples of things that would be on like the energy draining side. Cool. And then cool. we'll break down the other side. Dude. So I'll, I'll, I'll do it right now. So that's the thing. It's, it's a continual adjustment and continual battle because in, in your business and life, you, you'll think you're at a great spot. And then you start to adopt these things back in that drain your energy. So that's why I do it every quarter now. So today, um, yeah, I took the one going into Q1. I'm getting ready to take the one going into Q2. Things that drain uh, the energy for me right now, I'm, I'm actually leading the marketing team right now. We're looking for a new leader and we're looking for, uh, and, and I'm still CEO. So Oliver, um, going through and, and, and doing any process related around hiring drains my energy. But I absolutely love hopping on those calls with the candidates, right? Like the right candidate. I love that. And so uh, when I came into the first quarter, I was failing at that hire. And it's because all those steps were on my lap as I pulled away with my team and I said, okay, this is draining my energy. And I'm actually not even spending a lot of time on it now when I should because I, I hate it so much. And so they came in and said, well, I love this part of it. And now I, I'm able to engage just in what gives me energy in the hiring process. Another example is, like I said, for me, um, I love strategy. 
Okay. Like, so I'll, I'll go to the whiteboard. I love sitting down and having these combos. I would love talking with the person across the street who's got the picture framing studio and like just brainstorm ideas and how they build their business. But then I want to leave. Like, I don't want to execute it for them. And so that's a, a good example. Another thing, dude, is energy giving, working out and like actually drinking crap tons of water gives me lots of energy. Um, mm. So th that's a hard one, right? Because we all know we're supposed to do it. But uh, when I went, when I came into this year, energy audit, I'm like, dude, working out gives me energy. But I was in a two to three day a week thing and it, it wasn't working out enough to where I was growing anymore. Because if you're only working out three days a week, that means you're not working out four days a week. It means you're actually staying stagnant or going backwards. And in December, I'm like, all right, I'm going to shift that. And so I've worked out every day, uh, even two times a day, uh, every single day since December 1st. And I drink a gallon of water. Dude, energy's through the roof all day. So I'm like, all right, cool. Like, there's that. Now, what do I what do I eliminate? Energy draining. I eliminated Instagram. Uh, so mm -hmm. my, my goal there was looking at the darn, uh, the cell phone weekly you know, screen time thing. So cool. I'm going to take this down from 10, from 10 hours or whatever to three hours and let's keep on tracking it, managing my calendar. And that's a really time. good one, man. That's a really good one. And it's such a slap in the face when you look at it. Sometimes you're like, man, did I it really is. waste that much time? And for those of you that don't know what we're talking about on your phone, there's a, uh, a, a it's an app it's built in that basically tracks how long you're on each social media site and you can look yeah. at it. And uh, if the numbers yeah. are too high, you can take corrective measures like Trevor did. And Dude. it sounds like you don't regret that at all. No, 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 not at all. Am I perfect? hundred percent. No, dude. Like I'll, I'll have a day where I go, shoot, how did I, how did that happen? Then it's kind of a checkpoint. But one of the biggest things, uh, this is in 2016, this is where energy audit, you know, literally saved my life was uh, 2016. Um, you know, carrot had started two years prior, then I'll, I'll circle back and kind of you know, say what the heck carrot is. But, um, uh, 2014 is when carrot started 2016, I had my head down for 18 months or so starting this company, helping at that time, real estate investors generate uh, more off market leads, off market seller leads, um, dominating Google and it, helping them attract this evergreen flow of, of the most motivated leads. That's what we do. And the way that we do it is the exact same way that, that we teach our clients to do it. It's, it's, you get a good quality website online that is fast and, and, um, is structured in a way to convert really well. And then you put the right content on that website and you continue to put good, robust content out there that attracts people. And then you amplify it with paid marketing. That's literally the way we market at carrot. And it's the way that our clients market. And so, uh, I was the guy who wrote all the articles. Uh, I would, I would sit there and I'd write two a week and there were long articles to, to get ranked in Google and uh, you know, attract our clients to buy carrot. And it was pretty routine for me, Oliver, to, to be up until one, two, three in the morning, at least, at least three to four nights a week uh, during that phase. It was kind of the grind phase. And just like, just like if you picture gears grinding, they can only grind for so long, you know, before the thing breaks. Uh, it's not yeah. going to take too long. 2016, I didn't realize I was close to breaking, but uh, I was, I was kind of justifying it thinking, well, it's okay if I'm doing this because it's for the family, right? I'm doing this for a better life for the family. And I, and I, I can put up with me not getting much sleep as long as it doesn't impact my family. And I remember uh, one day I was doing a bender, you know, getting one of those articles done. Cause that's, how, that's what drove business. And I was good at it. Got paid well to do it. Right. Going back to the original story. Um, but it drained my energy and I didn't realize it until this time we were going to my parents' house. They live a few hours away over the mountains, middle of the day, it was up until three in the morning the night before cranking on an article, getting business done. And one second I was awake, you know, we're up in the mountains, you know, swerving, uh, swerving road with the, the guardrail up there. And one second I was awake and the next second I wasn't, um, three kids in the back, my wife up front, she was reading, uh, which said two, three in the afternoon. And just like in the movies and you think there's no way, like there's no way that would actually happen. Uh, I woke up in just the right time to see the guardrail, there's a ravine, a curve, you know, guardrail, no guardrail here and there. And I woke up in just the right amount of time to swerve. Um, our Yukon XL hit the guardrail, uh, put a big old dent in the, in that I stopped dead cold in the highway. And my wow. wife said, what happened? I said, I fell asleep and I didn't drive a family trip for six months after that. But the big change that happened all over was this. I got back home and I said, energy audit, let's pull this thing back out. And why is it that I'm grinding myself into a pulp? And what things do I need to get off my lap? 
And at that moment I did it. I'm like, man, writing articles, that's what drives our business. I have to do that. And I said, well, what if I don't? And what, what, what would I love to add? And I love podcasts. How am I going to make money doing podcasts? I have no clue, but I love it. Let me just chase energy. And so I started the podcast, uh, Carrot Cast, summer of 2016, just to get energy. Like, that was it. I'm like, I don't care if we get business. I just want to do it for energy. And then I found the best writer that I could possibly find to hire to do all my writing for me. That guy ended up, after working for me, became the editor-in-chief of the Shopify Plus blog. So he jumped from me to Shopify as editor. Wow. Uh, man, I wish I had him back. And uh, I didn't write another blog post since. And so I shifted all of my content over to video. And now I take my video and turn it into written articles, which we can talk about how agents uh, can do the same thing. But that, that energy out of uh, saved my life big time. Yeah. I mean, wh like, wow, like really powerful stuff. I, uh, obviously that was probably a big awakening for you being in that experience in the car with your family like yeah. that. I can't even imagine. Um, but to then recognize that, hey, even and I think this is a big one for entrepreneurs. And, and I find myself saying this, too, is like, no, 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 this is like I have to do this. Yep. And the reality is you really don't have to do it in mm -hmm. most cases. And in, you gave a perfect example, like you were writing killer blogs. They were working. Why? Why sub that out? But when you looked at the energy audit and how much time it was taking and the toll it was taking, the mental damage, the bandwidth, all that other stuff. Yep. Um, and just making a big pivot, I think that's uh, really powerful because you can get rid of those things that are on your plate. You can outsource it. Mm -hmm. There's definitely someone better than you at it. You just yep. have to find that person. And dude, and, and the key, and I think this is what I realized, you know, later than I'd hoped, and this relates directly to real estate agents and investors is that the key is, well, yeah, I didn't have to do the act of writing the content, but uh, what what I could still do was I could still do what was unique to me about that content, which was my thoughts, my framework, my way of thinking in it. I could just change the methodology. So ra rather than me sitting down and pounding out, you know, a thousand or two thousand words, I could record an eight minute video and then I could get that over to my team. They could transcribe that darn video, put it up on the blog, and then they could make it look good. Like then you could have a writer come in with my essence on it, my personality yep. still what's unique about me. And then they could make it nice so it's still ranked in Google. And we, yeah. we made that same shift with and for our clients this past couple of years. Because, you know, with, with real estate agents especially, most, most of you don't have time to sit down and write content. But you want that evergreen flow of the, the most qualified leads, the ones that convert the best, uh, especially sellers. And the ones that convert the best, it's like you've got referrals over here. One-to-one -one referral, you know, Jane worked with me. Jane refers me over. Uh, literally with the data from a HubSpot study referrals and inbound SEO convert the same. Um, but the problem with, wow. with referrals are uh, sometimes it's harder to grow that because it, you've got to go out there and hustle, hustle, hustle. Um, with inbound, you can stack a piece of content. It's a blog post. It's a, what I call video post, that method of recording a video and transcribing it and then making an article. You can uh, stack one of those a week. And over the course of a year, you've got 52 amazing pieces of content that answer questions for your, for your market. And then some of them will pop and rank really, really well. And we can give some examples of what people can do there in under 10 minutes a week to start yeah. building the authority. Yeah, I was just going to say, I definitely want to go a little deeper on that because uh, I agree that, and, and you know, all of our agents are always coming to us and they, they come to a lot of our trainings and stuff. And then the number one thing is they want to produce really good localized content, yep. but they don't know how, or they don't have the time or, you know, they don't have the resources, but I think that the way that you broke it down is really simple and, and brilliant is taking that eight minute video and, you know, giving your thoughts. And this could be like on a neighborhood or on, yep. you know, we'll, we'll break down some ideas, but uh, the concept of just giving your thoughts on it and then sending it to a blog writer to actually produce a beautiful blog that it has seo power and has great images and it's just well put together um is going to go so much further than you trying to get through it yourself or to your point writing three thousand word blog posts until three in the morning yeah um so break down that process for me because I, yep. I think that's a really good nugget so like um maybe some video topic ideas and then mm -hmm. how you structure the video to give to the blog person. 
dude, for sure. I, am I able to share screen? Cause I could even, even show a couple things possibly. Cool. What, what, what I'll do Oliver is I'll walk through exactly how I come up with topics and I'll show you guys what the output could look like and how to structure the actual page. Cause um, it's actually even simpler than probably most people are thinking the way that we do it now, we help real estate investors and real estate agents uh, get off the marketing hamster wheel and attract uh, those evergreen leads through Google. Uh, most real estate investors or most real estate agents uh, and investors tend to focus on what I call hamster wheel marketing. Um, there we go. I can share it up. Cool. Right there. And uh, with hamster wheel marketing, that's your direct mail, cold calling, uh, open houses, door knocking, driving for dollars, all that kind of stuff. And they all work, right? Like that's the thing. All those marketing methods I just said, they work. Cold calling works amazingly well. Direct mail works amazingly well. Knock on doors works well. Um, all that stuff works. The The question is this, is, is um, what do you have to keep on doing to make that successful over the long term? Well, you got to keep doing it, right? Like to, to have cold call being successful, you have you or someone on your team has to continually call people. Like, you, as soon as you stop calling people, the result of cold calling goes like this. And so right. it drops you know, off yeah, quick. Yeah. You got to get back on the hamster wheel and then you got to do it again. So what if you want to go on a month vacation? You know, I, I take a month off uh, every, every July and the business grows when I'm gone. And I, I have some agents and investors that the same thing happens. And so my, my shift is how do you shift towards more evergreen marketing where you do marketing once and that marketing works for months and years, and then you yes. amplify it with cold calling. Now there is a transition period, right? Like if cold calling or knocking on doors or whatever it is, is your main method of marketing right now, you can't just go cold Turkey and stop that and then do evergreen. Like I'm going to show you because evergreen is going to take, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 months to really get momentum. And so there's going to be that first year where it's going to be some hard work. It's going to be a mental shift in the way that you think about marketing. It's not just a marketing tactic. It's a fundamental shift in the way that we think about marketing. And then you can eventually make the choice to say, hey, uh, like Christina Kudlock, one of our clients, she's an investor and agent, was in LA, just moved to Phoenix. Uh, she'd been doing cold calling as her main thing. The last two years, she's really built up her SEO with her content on the carrot system and uh, gained a number one ranking in Los Angeles. And she's top five now in Phoenix. And she uh, was on a podcast with me a couple months ago and she said, I'm finally killing cold calling. So for her, freedom meant I can kill cold calling because she didn't like it, but it took her about a year to year and a half to do that. And so um, I'll, I'll share the screen. This is what I, this is the way that I, I like to look at it and think about it is let's say that you are, um, I'll, I'll give a couple examples of proof. Before, and then yeah. Before we jump into that, I just want to, I just want to interject one thing because I yep. think that, um, you hit the nail on the head perfectly in talking about how it, it's all part of a wheel, right? Yep. It's all part of a wheel and the cold calling is part of it, but creating evergreen content is the long game. Mm. And the more evergreen content that you can create that ranks high in the search engines, the type that we're about to break down right now, yep. the more leads you're going to get over time, the more places your content's going to be seen, the more organic traffic you're going to get. And these are the types of seller leads uh, that, that Trevor was talking about, real estate investor leads, all kinds of stuff. And the, the, cool part about these strategies is they really work in any market. Yep. And, um, and, and like I said, it's just, this is, this is the long game for anyone in the real estate business, because you want to create a business that's going to keep growing and feed itself for a long period of time. So Dude, let's break that down. hundred percent. So I'm going to show two slides in this. I'm going to show uh, real, real things you guys can do. So first thing right here is, is we might be asking, this is part of that mental mindset shift. And we eat our own dog food, dude. We grow our, our business, eight figure your business the exact same way. Um, and so first of all, we, we start with, this is literally a screenshot from uh, most of 2020. Um, if I were to pull up our analytics right now, this is our actual analytics for our customer sites. So I'm in the back end. This is live as of right now. Uh, so for since Feb 1st, 2020 through today, 535,000 leads uh, have came in. Uh, the majority of them are direct and organic. About half the ones that end up lumping into direct are likely organic, but we don't know. And you can see this. This is conversions over here, Oliver. So um, bounce rate's much lower because they're seeking out a solution. And then the conversion rate, though, and this is this is the gross conversion rate. This is like, it doesn't matter if the person literally landed on a blog post or the contact page or the FAQ page or a landing page. So 
a, a landing page or our homepage, they're going to convert way higher than 3.54% organic, but this is a blended rate. And so if you look at this, so referrals from another site, 1.8% conversion rate, email display marketing, 0.07, uh, paid search marketing. So this is like a Google ad 1.78% on average. Most of these are seller leads. Um, and then this right here, social 2.3% conversion and organic search, uh, 3.54%. So you can actually get less traffic and convert more leads through this method because they're more targeted uh, mm -hmm. uh, types of people. And like you were it. saying earlier, that the mindset shift is this, is, is hamster wheel marketing works and someone's got to run on the hamster wheel. It's either got to be you, which that's where you, you could run the risk of being tired out in five, 10 years where you're looking back going, I've done a bunch of deals, but I'm still in the same spot I was 10 years ago. And I can't take the month vacation. I can't do this, whatever it is. So you've either got to build a team, which is an amazing route to do. I built a team here at Carrot. We're 40 plus employees. So I'm never going to say that you should just do a bunch of content, not build a team. You've got to have some things where people get on the hamster wheel for you. Okay. But then you go, okay, with my marketing, how do I get off the hamster wheel as much as possible and grow this evergreen uh, part of it? And then I can then eventually phase out the rest of it if I wanted to. Now, right. I'm never going to suggest that people phase out all of ever uh, all of Hampshire Wheel because that's where you get your volume. Your volume of deals and leads is going to come from outbound. It's going to come from sending out the mail, sending out the cold calls to activate demand for people that aren't actively looking on Google. But your highest quality, most motivated ones are going to come from uh, a Google search. OK, so let's say you're a, a real estate agent here locally in Roseburg, as an example. Um, or you're uh, a house seller, you know, sell my house in Brentwood, California. So you know, they're um, down there in California. If you were to type this out, you're probably someone who has a very clear intent to sell your house in Brentwood, right? And they're probably looking at doing it semi soon, especially if they would add the word fast or something like that, right? You add the word <laughs> fast, like, oh man, they're probably pretty interested in selling pretty quickly. So this one here, you have a bunch of ads here, which you can launch those immediately. We like, we like ads. Uh, the number one result here organically is a real estate agent, Krista May Shore. Uh, she's been a carrot client for a few years and it lands on this page and she gets sellers coming through this every single month. And so that's one strategy is you, you go after sellers in that way as an agent or an investor, launch a page that says sell your house fast or whatever it is. And we don't have time today to, to talk about how to optimize a page. We have some free trainings on that. But then you get the leads, really good conversion um, uh, form there. This page doesn't look pretty. You know, she literally launched it, threw it up there, and then we'll make it look pretty later. Or another example is, you know, best neighborhoods in Roseburg, Oregon. Mm -hmm. If I'm looking for the best neighborhood, I'm likely probably wanting to buy something. And so what Anthony Beckham did was exactly what we talked about. Realtor.com was ranked number one there. And now him is the only real estate agent on page one. He recorded a video, just like we talked. He titled it, what people would type into Google. And then he took the transcription of that video. This is just the transcription down here. And then he had someone on his team throw in some pictures. That's it. And then it took about a month to two months for him to rank. And this is where Evergreen comes in. That was done June 24th. So this is, yeah, this is perfect. And and you can really see the power of, of ranking high in keywords like that. Like if someone, to your first example, types in sell my home fast Brentwood and Krista's website pops up number one. Like there's a good chance she's getting leads off that. I mean, I yep. don't know what the search volume is, but I'm guessing there's quite a bit in terms of uh, people looking for that keyword. It, um, exactly. And so bring up one of those pages again. So, so yep. what I'm hearing you say is, okay, so this one here is top five best neighborhoods in city name, Roseburg, Oregon, in this example. Yep. So then the agent in this would just shoot a quick video on their thoughts on the top five uh, best neighborhoods in Roseburg, Oregon. Uh, and this doesn't have to be any high production. You could be at home in your pajamas. Yep. You just shoot it, get out all your thoughts. And then they're sending it to a blogger who's putting this all together. Correct. Even simpler, man. So I'm going to show you guys a way to do it. Um, so yes, but I'll show you guys a way to do it in like a quarter of the time. So Sweet. that's one that's one route to do it. And that's the way that I did it for years was I'd shoot the video. We would upload it to YouTube. We'd, we'd go to rev.com, rev.com. We'd upload it over there. Three, four hours later, we'd get the transcription. We'd open up the Word document. We'd copy it. We'd go over to WordPress. We'd paste it. There'd be errors because you're pasting it from, from Microsoft Word to WordPress. And then we put the video. You, know, you get the idea, right? So it was yeah. about 45 minutes of manual work, including the five to eight minute video. 
Um, now what we do is this is number one, the first tip is this, if you're going to do these videos, we call them video posts. Uh, you want it to be somewhere between three and eight minutes, ideally. And now here's why. Um, in order to rank a piece of content, one of the biggest um, uh, things that I see that's in common where an agent specifically, but also investors are struggling to get a piece of content ranked is there's not enough words on the page. You know, they, they've got two or 300 words in the page and they're going, I did the thing just like you guys thought, you know, why is it ranking well? It's like, well, there's not enough words in the page. And the average page for, you know, best neighborhoods in Roseburg, Oregon, uh, that's ranking up in the top five let's i'm making this up but if you average them out maybe they have 800 words and there's no way you're going to compete with 300 words if you're not like zillow or something like that and so what we did is we we reverse engineered the process we literally looked at zillow and realtor and all those sites and we started to figure out what elements do they have what how many what's the average word count and so three minutes spoken uh, the average person speaks 120 to 160 words a minute so if you times that out it's about 500 words written uh, uh, 800 or eight minutes is about a thousand words written. And so you're somewhere between the 500 and a thousand words, anything less than 500 words or less than three minutes, you're going to have a, a hard time, uh, getting something to rank. And so, so that's the sweet spot. It's a sweet spot. And you could do over 10 minutes, but then the problem with that is it ends up being this massive thing that's just hard for people to digest and get through. So three to eight minutes. And those are good ones too, that you could upload to to IGTV, you could upload to uh, Facebook and, and throw in there as a retargeting ad, <clears throat> something like that. And cool. so the overall strategy, you create the content, you get people here, hopefully they opt in home value or whatever it is, but then you retarget them back with more content just like that. This one was more professional. Like his brand is he's the fancy professional video young guy in town, right? But let me show you one that's the opposite. So Roseburg farmland, they're specialists in, in farmland. Look at this date, May 5th, 2017. That's evergreen, dude. Like that's almost three years later, almost four years later. Four that years. Yeah, wow. Still ranked number one in Google over all these national sites. And this one here was literally that guy. That they would never sit down and write content. I'm like, Denny, if you could go out there and just record a three to five minute video, get it into YouTube, put it into our system that automates that whole thing. So we have something called video posts. You literally put in the, the URL for the YouTube video and it, pulls it all in. It transcribes it automatically. It puts the video in the post. It pulls in your title, puts a description on there, puts an opt-in box at the bottom, emails you two hours later and says your post is ready. And wow. you can, and you can now log in and modify it. You can put pictures on there. You can update your headings or whatever. Right. But that's all they did. They put it into video post. This popped out. Uh, this video is three minutes and 23 seconds on, on a cell phone, not fancy. Right. Yeah, just a guy out there standing in front of some farmland in a black shirt and uh, yep. talking about farmland. And, 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 they <laughs> and he ranks as uh, the number one result. So that's that's yep. pretty cool. And I'll show one. I'll show it. one last one. I'll kick it back over to you because I know we're at the uh, close to the hour. Uh, yeah, one last cool. one is you know you've got um, location pages. So a lot of people will say, "Well, shoot." There's no way, like I'm, I'm just going to do Instagram and Facebook, which is that's all hamster wheel guys and gals. So where, where a lot of agents are doing their content, uh, they're using social media as their home of, of their content, which is awesome. But what, what happens? Well, you've got to post every single day to get that content in front of people. You always mm -hmm. have to post. Um, so you're posting the content and it's going away and you got it. You're on the hamster wheel. You're on the hamster wheel. You can never get off of it. And so what we say is, okay, instead of making Instagram or Facebook your home, what if you make what we call an authority hub your home? So most people have a website, just a website, and it's like, hey, I've got my Glamour Shop photo, I've got my IDX, and I've got all that stuff up on it. But what if instead you took that and made it into what we call an authority hub, which is all of your credibility is there. That's the home of your credibility, not Zillow reviews, not Google reviews. The home of it's here, but yeah, drive Google reviews for sure. Like you should for sure do that. Um, and number two, you build out your location pages like this here. You know, you, you build out the location pages. I'll show a quick diagram of what an authority hub is and why it's important here. Um, so this, this is an authority hub. You've got your, your homepage. You've got a good opt-in box, whatever it is. You've got your core conversion pages. So that's your, hey, sell or buy or how it works, your reviews, your about page, stuff like that. And that helps to increase conversion once people land there. And then you've got what we call the niche or location pages. You know, do these quarterly, you know, do three, four, five of these location pages quarterly and say, well, what neighborhoods do I want to create a page for an hour? What cities am I also doing work in? 
And then those video posts are what we do weekly. That's what we call the authority content. And that's where you do your three to five minute video every week, upload it to YouTube, put it into video posts, automatically gets it on your, on your authority hub. And now share that on the social media. Okay, share that puppy on social media. And make sure Great that your tip. website is that. the hub of everything. So is that just a WordPress site in, in this example here? Yep. Yeah. It's, you could use WordPress or whatever it is uh, with carrot. I mean, that's what we do as is okay. this is, this is what we do as a service. Uh, so software, when you yeah. say you do it as a service, are you providing the websites or are you uh, coaching them on how to do their own websites? Yep. Good question, man. Yes. Yeah, so our, our software is, is the website. Um, our software is the website. It's, it's got all the tracking in the back end of it. Um, it's got the video post feature in the back end of it. Um, it's drag and drop editor, the whole thing. So if, if you, if you are wanting to do it, you would come in here, literally launch your site. Uh, if you're an investor or an agent or what we call a hybrid, which is what we're driving really hard right now, Oliver is the investor agent, the person who's both, you can launch a yep. hybrid site in here. We have this, the website is in our system. We focus on performance. Number one loads fast, converts great, gives you an edge in ranking in Google. And then the tools to help assist you uh, to get those rankings up. Yep. Killer. So this is very turnkey. Uh, you were just showing us the back end of Carrot, uh, where it basically looks like it does all of this for you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what does that cost? What does this service cost a monthly yeah, or it's, it's, yearly or whatever it is? It, it's between 100 and 200 bucks a month, depending on the plan that the plan that you pick. And if what, what, what a lot of people do, like with the FAR group, they're one of the top, I think they're number three agents in Spokane now. Um, they didn't want to go through and customize their site. So when, when you launch a site, it's going to be, the whole structure is going to be dialed in for conversion and it's got stock content, but you're going to want to make it your own, especially as an agent. And yep. so that's where we have services of people like, you know, I'd much, much rather have someone do this for us. Uh, this was our concierge service where we went in, took their, their, I, you know, put our ADX into it, took their content, their credibility, built it out in, in here for them. That's killer, man. Yep. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, really good stuff all the way around because uh, you know, that's something that we do on um on a few of our sites as well, is just building those hyper local pages yep. and really just um, you know, going deep on those because that's where the gaps are. That's mm -hmm. where the Zillows are not, that's where the red fins are not. Yep. So the more hyper local you can go and the more you can just uh stand out and in Google's eyes, the better. I think that's it, exactly. And I'll, I'll finish this with this man is, is like I said, I, I want people to combat that, that Zillow, um, inferior complex, you know, where we, we think well, shoot Zillow already owns Google. And I think that's why so many agents don't, um, put their content on their, what we call an authority hub because they think Zillow already owns it. So like, well, I'm, you know, everyone's revolting against Zillow now and all this kind of stuff. And I'm going, well, guys, it, it's, it, it's going to take work. I'm not going to say you push a couple buttons and it happens. Like it takes work and it's going to take patience. But the way that Zillow became dominant was not by running a bunch of Facebook ads or doing cold calling. It was by creating content, evergreen content, stacking that content on over a consistent period of time, uh, building pages for everything. And then over time they dominated, it took years for them to dominate. But the way that you beat them, like with this one here, is you do things Zillow can't do. Like Zillow can't go as deep in the North Umpqua River as I can if I'm an expert in that. <laughs> right. And so, so I, I can create Zillow's a Zillow's not going to send someone out to the farmland to take a video about it. <laughs> exactly. And so if I create right. a longer, more robust piece of content that engages people longer, just like this, you're going to outrank Zillow if it's on a fast website and it works well. So this is our client and you've got Zillow and Realtor and Redfin and they're dominating for their niches. Yeah, I love it. I really love what you guys are doing over there, man. It's it's uh, it's a cool project. I know a lot of our agents use it. Uh, I know Krista is really happy with it. Um, she's uh, in our mastermind as well. So yeah. shout out to her. Um, let's uh, let me shift gears a little bit because I think we're wrapping up. Um, oh, just real quick, if anyone wants to learn more about the energy audit or uh, your stuff with Carrot, where can they find out more about that? Dude, uh, yeah, energy audit is carrot.com forward slash Trevor, actually. Uh, that's another page you can go to where it's got all my stuff. So carrot.com forward slash Trevor. That's T-R-E-V-O-R. It's got a link to my podcast, the Carrot Cast. Um, it's got a link to the energy audit and my daily productivity system that I use to 
to, to try to stay as organized and efficient and effective as possible. So carrot.com forward slash Trevor. I love it. Cool. And smart for those listening. Notice how he put all of his resources on one page on his website to make it easy for people. That's exactly what you want to do for your people. That way, when you're on podcasts, when you're at networking events, if you get a stage or you're at a neighborhood group, you just say, hey, go to, you know, XYZ homes slash info or whatever the page is where you can find out everything. Before we wrap up, I want to I want to kind of unpack the co-working deal that you did. Oh, yeah, because yep. I think that um, that's an interesting type of real estate deal. And uh, I'd love to just unpack um what the project is yep. and kind of how you put it all together. Cool. So uh, it's exciting. So I've actually got two, two going on. So this one here. Um, so I'm, I'm in a small town, 25,000 people. And we moved here in 2008 and uh, I took over this building downtown in 2010. And so I, the reason I say that is it kind of gives some context for the timing and where we were as it relates to coming out of the um, you know, the housing crash and all that stuff, downtowns and small towns were kind of decimated at that, at that time. And so there's a lot of space open. And so I think this would be a good illustration. You can get really creative. Now it might be a little bit more difficult in some markets right now to get these kinds of deals. But when I was wanting to get office, I saw this building downtown and I didn't have the money to buy it or to rent it, uh, for, for 8,000 square feet. So I came in here and talked with the owner and this space was vacant. And there's going to be a lot of vacant space right now coming out of the, the, the pandemic, commercial space, restaurant space, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so I talked to him and I said, I, here's my vision. I want to create an entrepreneur workspace. I want to fill this up with energy. I want to make, make it the, the, the entrepreneur capital of, of Roseburg, right? And I said, but I can rent this one office, but I want to be able to control everything else. But I can only pay 200 bucks a month. So 8,000 square feet. And, and um, I locked it down for 200 bucks a month. Um, <laughs> no long-term lease, nothing. Okay. I control everything in here. Then what happened was I said, okay, then as I fill office spaces, then we'll hammer down a, a, a monthly rent for each office space. I'll take a 10% override on all that. And then you get the rest. She pays all of the utilities, every utility. Um, I get a 10% override and we can't lose money because if someone moves out of an office, we just don't pay for it, but we control the entire thing. We've been here for 10 years and it's such a cool spot, man. We've got, you know, a lounge, a full gym here now, a content studio, and um, we don't pay anything for it, which is kind of cool. So, <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it's a good vibrant thing. Part of my team's here. Most of it's not, but down the street, a block away is another building. A bank just moved out. And this is where there's opportunities right now. Like you were saying, Oliver, is with the pandemic, a lot of companies went remote. And I think that's going to, um, that's going to be a trend that will still hold strong for several years. And some of the companies aren't going back to office or the levels and the sizes of office they had before. And so uh, you're looking at all these people who are at home now and, uh, and they might not have an office, but you can only work at home for so long. Like you were saying, you can only right. work at Starbucks for so long. And there's a grinder and the, the frother and all that kind of stuff going on in the background every 14 seconds. Right. And so this bank moved out three months ago, they have it listed at eight 95. It's a big, huge space. It's really cool. We made an offer on that last week. Uh, we haven't heard back on it yet, but we're hoping we can take that in the energy that we have here and turn that space into an, an amazing, it's about 20,000 square feet. We're going to turn that into an even bigger co work space. Cause there isn't one here in town other than our little one here. And it's always full. And so I think it's gonna be an amazing opportunity to, to, to go and find some of this vacant space because of pandemic and see where there's opportunity to build little hubs of energy of workers, of entrepreneurs and negotiate really good discounts on the space. Yeah. I love it, man. I love how you keep going back to energy. One, I love how you're doing a lot of creative real estate investing stuff. I think that that co-working space is, is, unbelievable how you can control that thing for 200 bucks a month and then basically for you that's got to be great because you can control the vibe of the whole building yep. the tenants make sure everyone's a culture fit in terms of like the tenants that are coming in and uh and yep. then you get a nice little override for yourself as well so yeah. you can't beat and, that. and i don't own this building so people might be asking like i don't own this one it doesn't make any right. sense to own this one at the terms i've got but i own the that's building what i'm right. saying there's no yeah you don't even need to why, yep, why own exactly. it yeah. No taxes, no utilities, nothing. It's awesome. Great. <laughs> I love it, man. It's beautiful. Um, 
So just a couple of things to wrap up. What, um, and you're a tech guy, so I'm curious to see what your answer is. I just like asking people, mm-hmm. what are, what's your favorite tool, software, app, just thing that makes your life easier, job easier, any of that? Dude, this is, this is probably going to be funny for people, but I use Apple Notes like no other because <laughs> kind, of, kind of going back to energy audit, I love ideas. And I learned as my yeah. team grew, I could no longer slack them through to everybody all the time. Uh, and send them off into like a scattered directions. So um, on my Apple notes, this is what I have pinned at the top. So I've got these core ones here. And anytime an idea comes up or if I'm reading a book or I learn a life truth um, when I'm reading books or if I think of something or I hear something, I start to write down these life truths. And my aim is to have you know hundreds of these life truths over the years, maybe write a book, but hand them down to my kids for sure. But I, I use Apple notes a lot. And uh, content That's ideas- awesome, man. Yeah, content ideas go on there. I'll share the note with my assistant or with my content marketer. And so they've got access to it. And anytime they bring, they come to me with the meeting, they now come with my notes and then we make decisions. Simple and easy. I like it. And I've never seen how you could pin notes like that. So Mm -hmm. uh, my whole problem with the Apple notes is my list is just so long. I got (laughs) to scroll forever to find stuff. But if I could pin, you know, the five or six most important ones at the top, Brilliant. Love it. Pin them, man. Yeah, I've got life truths, content ideas, brain dumps or open loops, uh, product ideas, systems and processes that need change, then big ideas. And I'll just pop them in there and people have access to them and it helps. Yeah, pin them. Pin it to win it. I like (laughs) it. (laughs) Um, All right, cool. And then uh, last question. And I always like to get different feedback from different people, but I got two young boys and I would just be curious what you would tell two young children on how to be successful in life. Mm, man. Um, dude, I mean, I, I, I don't want to sound cliche or anything, but this is just what it's, it's a part of me now. Uh, but kind of going back to the energy thing, you know, it's, it's like figure out what gives you energy and what you love and just always focus on doing more of that. Like no, no matter if it makes you more money or not. Um, I, I think if you're doing something with enough energy and it gives you enough energy, you're probably going to be pretty damn good at that thing. And if you do it enough, you could probably get noticed by people and somehow make a career out of it. And so chase energy, not money, hopefully money follows. Um, but I'd much rather be high energy and doing things that I love and be broke versus really low energy, miserable and have a bunch of money. So that's me. I love it. Great advice. And I do really like that energy audit. I'm going to give that a try. I think that's a really cool idea. Uh, I've never heard that before. And I just think it just, you know, evaluating your life and, and you can almost look at it like what brings you joy and what doesn't, you know, and, and, and it's just, it's a simple way to look at things. And I think it's not something that you're going to change immediately or overnight, but the way you look at it in terms of, okay, this quarter, let me see if I can inch it up a little bit. And then, you know, over the course of a year, four quarters, yep. over the course of a couple of years, now all of a sudden you get to that 50, 50, or then yep. the ultimate like 80, 20 of positive energy to energy drain. Yeah. And you're never going to get to hundred percent. Like just t- take that off the table. Y'all hundred yeah. percent not going to get there. It's definitely not but, happening. Yeah. 70 to 80% to me is a great target. Yeah. You get there. You're definitely winning. Yep. For sure. For sure. Right on Trevor. Well, I really appreciate it, man. Do you have anything uh, you want to wrap with? Dude, I, I just want to um, let you know, I appreciate you big time, dude. Just what, what you guys put out there to the world and growing big block the way that you are and um, just being honest, ethical guys who think big, uh, which which uh, isn't isn't the norm out there. And so I appreciate you and Sam big time for what you guys do and any way that I can help and plug back into the mastermind now that COVID is is semi looking like it's we're, yes. we're, there's a light, a light at the, the end of the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> I just love what you guys are doing, man. So anyone listening to this or watching this and real closers or a part of their community, keep doing it because they're they're the real deal. I see what they're doing on the real estate side of things. See the deals you guys are putting together in San Diego, uh, those apartments and the developments and man, you guys are doing cool stuff. So keep it up. Yeah, man. Thank you for the kind words. Really appreciate it. Um, I would say the same thing about you looking forward to 
getting back together in real life when uh, when all that can happen again. And uh, really appreciate you as well. Love what you're doing. Definitely keep an eye on this guy. Uh, you want to shout out that page that you have where all your stuff is again one more time? Yep, carrot.com forward slash Trevor. Uh, and if you guys are interested in the in the evergreen concept, uh, I've got a, a on-demand training. Just carrot.com forward slash evergreen. There you go. Bada bing, bada boom. Yep. If you have any questions, put them down below. We'll definitely circle back and answer those. Uh, give us a like. Help the al algorithms push this out to everybody. Um, make sure you subscribe for future episodes. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you, guys. Thank you.